Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome to Global Insights. In today's panel, we're hosting experts from the Balsillie School of International Affairs in Canada, the American University in the United States, and the Institute of Strategic Affairs in Ethiopia. And today we're speaking on the topic of climate change, or as we have titled it, World on Fire. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC, and Global Inaction on Climate Change. My name is Scott Hamilton, and I'm the research coordinator at the BSIA, and I'm delighted to serve as moderator for today's session. A warm welcome to all participants joining us today in the audience. Now, we would invite you to direct any questions for panelists using the Q&A function of your Zoom page, and we'll do the best we can to put your questions back to the panelists. Now, before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. For those in the audience who are tuning in from outside of Canada, one of the actions we take to advance reconciliation between settler and indigenous peoples is to reflect on our relationship with the land and the continuous process of colonization that deeply impacts our work. Acknowledging the land is the process of deliberately naming that this is indigenous land and indigenous people have rights to this land. The Belsilly School of International Affairs is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the six nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River which is on the traditional territory of the Atawandran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. It is particularly important that we here at the school acknowledge the land upon which we are situated in everything that we do, including Global Insights. So to start us off on today's conversation, let's turn to our distinguished panel. Marie-Claire cordonnier Seger, full professor of law at the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development and the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo, is an international advisor of the Interdisciplinary Center on Climate Change, or IC3, at the Belsillie School of International Affairs. She is also uh, the Leverhulme Trust Visiting Professor at the University of Cambridge. Jonathan Hui is a PhD candidate and support officer for the Environment and Resources Research Cluster at the Belsillie School of International Affairs. Evan Morton is a research fellow at the American University Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy and an AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the US Department of Energy. Heldiana Suleiman is a researcher at the Institute of Strategic Affairs under the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy. She's a former lecturer at the Department of Natural Resource Management at Madawaluba University in Ethiopia. So thank you all once again for sharing your insights with all of us today uh, on the heels of COP26, uh, the world's largest and arguably most important climate event. So with COP26, the United Nations, FCCC, the Conference of the Parties, we've heard a lot of world leaders making big and bold promises with respect to things like reforestation, cutting methane emissions, climate financing, uh, and much else. But is this all hot air or might there be some walking going on behind the political talking here? Might we see some real action? So to start us off, Jonathan, what exactly is the role of COP and COP26 in organizing international climate action? Thank you, Scott. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Anne and all the people uh, helping organize this, uh, this great panel. Um, so the role of COP and COP26, um, COP is essentially a forum for cataloging uh, national targets and, and emission inventories um, ever since the, sort of the, the Paris Agreement uh, under what are called um, nationally determined contributions. Um, and the, the format is sort of every five years, there'll be an update of these NDCs. Uh, and then there'll be a conference where uh, diplomats will come and uh, try to push uh, countries that seem to be slower and try to help meet um, and, and sort of raise the ambition of um, uh, each subsequent um, conference. Uh, so it's sort of a political display. There's, uh, there's obviously a lot of things going on behind the scenes, but um, that's sort of the essential of it. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. It's good to know it. A nationally determined contribution stands for and also the political impetus behind it. It's not just the science of the numbers, it's the politics behind it. Uh, and that, that actually takes us to Evan as well. And when we look at NDCs and COP, is COP still a helpful and necessary meeting for global climate change mitigation? Does it matter? 
Yes, I think it does. It's a little bit of a tricky question to answer uh, just because the way that, uh, of course, climate change is a global problem. So it's very important that we come together to have discussions on what needs to be done, done to solve climate change. But in the respect of it being such a huge conference uh, with so many people, so many people traveling, creating that huge carbon footprint to get to that place, as well as the amount of waste that is uh, that is uh, accumulates through that conference. I attended COP24 in Poland, and it was a really great experience to meet so many people around the world and get to be a part of some of the side discussions. Um, it's also just a wonder of how we, we are implementing this conference and the way it actually impacts our climate in that way as well. But of course, it is very important for us to continue having global discussions. Otherwise, we won't be able to uh, collaborate in the way that we need to do so. Well, thanks, Evan. I see what you mean regarding uh, having such a global problem. It's so important for diplomats and stakeholders from states to meet in person, right, and have those discussions. Um, and speaking of meeting in person and having discussions at COP, turning to Mary Claire, who is not broadcasting from the inside of a spaceship, but Mary Claire, you're actually at COP26 right now in Scotland, which is amazing. Um, so please give us some of the, the early takeaways. What's it like there and what's the vibe at COP26 right now? Yeah, as you probably know, I serve as executive secretary for the Climate Law and Governance Initiative, which is about three or 400 organizations that come together working especially on law and, and governance aspects of the COP. And I think one of the things that we're seeing very clearly right now is that many pledges are being made. I think we have 130 trillion um, pounds that are being, being committed on finance. We have now a survey of the nationally determined contributions with different pledges that are being made. And one of the questions that we are asking over and over again is how can we ensure that these pledges are fulfilled in a way that is transparent, that is accountable, that is um, delivering on the commitments that have been offered over the years in these climate negotiations. You know, a lot of the challenge that we face in a huge endeavor like changing the direction of the global economy, which is what will be required if we want to avoid, um, you know, the unsurvivable future of five degrees warning. And, and, and if, we, if we look at that um, with a cool, hard light, those promises that get broken, including the promises for sustainable development, including the promises for climate justice, including the promises for space for, for loss and damage to be addressed in a way that is just, um, if, we, if we continue re breaking those promises, it becomes very difficult to ask for cooperation on any aspect. And that is a very, very important part of what is being done here. You know, it's, it's people meeting to evaluate how far they've come, to look at the science, and then to recommit and commit in a way that can be tracked and monitored and verified and people can be held accountable for, which is not as easy as one might think. It's incredibly complex. Oh, thank you. Um, when you speak of the, the immense scope, 130 trillion pounds, uh, global involvement, uh, the promises that nations make, 85% uh, of the deforestation, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it, the countries with forests. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's, it's tough to not only ensure that people stick to what they pledge, but that there's continuation between one COP to another. And that actually, that takes us to Heldiana as well. Heldiana, how exactly does COP26 advance states' commitments towards achieving the 2015 Paris Climate Change Agreement, which was a big one? Uh, and that's what served as kind of the international framework for collective action on climate change so far. What's the, what's the continuation we're seeing here? Yeah, well, we starting from Kyoto Protocol establishment uh, aimed at reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We have been hearing so many promises and so many plays to be uh, fulfilled, to be enacted in uh, different states, but still we are uh, falling behind our target, right? But uh, we hope that in Glasgow COP26 uh, this year hold a massive significance with global leaders uh, set to make significant legislation uh, change that could bring a new era in climate reforms. Um, While well, majority of the world leaders attended uh, the summit, uh, except the big two names, China and Russia, uh, showed strong uh, place to agreement. 
uh, we have heard so many ambitions and positive voices towards this agreement and how climate change can affect the world. But this is not uh, enough. Uh, you know, there has been an attention for uh, deforestation, water and the climate condition, emphasizing uh, the need for integrated water climate management, which is, uh, which is a good move. But this could not be enough uh, if uh, this kind of initiatives and investment that the world leaders may agree on, not uh, combined with effective action in their governance, financing and capacity building. So this week, uh, these two week summits in Glasgow is seen as a crucial. And I'm, uh, I hope uh, the world leaders uh, will, uh, will you know, respect their promises and uh, this summit will uh, increase the momentum of the leaders to commit uh, to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius goal alive. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Heliana. Uh, when you speak of uh, a lot of discussion between world leaders and, and globally, we're falling behind on our commitments. Um, it, it forces us to ask how we can actually enforce uh, the pledges that, that are being made, right? When we look at inside a state, if someone makes a transgression, it's easy because we have a police system, we have a legal system, we have governments, but of course, internationally, it's an anarchic system. There's no global police that's going to come get you if you violate your NDCs. Uh, so we're seeing right now under U.S. President Biden, we're, we're seeing some of these pretty bold pledges, but other mm -hmm. big emitters, other great powers, are they've been unwilling to make similar commitments and, and even show up in some cases. Um, so let's turn to the geopolitical context here. And I'm going to turn to Jonathan on this one. Jonathan, what exactly, uh, in terms of this geopolitical commitment, um, what are, what, what's exactly being discussed at COP26? How are states like China and India positioned uh, following their NDC commitments. Thanks, Scott. Um, it's it's sort of lukewarm. I I think I would say on that on that point. Um, so President Biden has come in, uh, sort of reaffirming that the U.S. is going to cut their emissions by fifty percent over 20, 2005 levels by twenty thirty, um, and they they've they've brought a lot of um, initiatives and, and and financing to to sort of uh, lay, lay their support out there, um, but. He's also facing a very uncertain domestic context with uh, his 1.75 trillion infrastructure bill, which is sort of the um, the centerpiece of his plan for for making that target. Um, I, I think one of the other s surprises or um, step ups is uh, Prime Minister Modi coming to the the conference and laying down uh, his net zero for 2070 and and uh, by 2030 having a 50 percent of energy mix uh, coming from um, renewable energy, um, and also unveiling this new initiative called One Sun, One World, One Grid, which is uh, within a geopolitical context, uh, somewhat of a reference, or um, I would say a, a, a challenge to try and link the entire world together with solar energy and, and transmission, uh, but obviously contingent on, on, on um, lots of financing from developed nations. Um, and then for China, um, President Xi obviously didn't, uh, didn't go to the COP, um, but there are, are also uh, massive domestic um, crises in terms of coal and, and um, um, energy currently, uh, since it's, it's, it's heading towards winter. Um, and, and right now uh, there are, um, there's an economic recovery coming. Um, and so there's, there's uh, just not enough energy to go around in China right now um, to feed both manufacturing and their, um, their domestic audiences. Um, uh, so China has not uh, raised its ambition from what it put together uh, last year, um, but it's it has worked it into its 14th and 15th year five year plans. Um, so uh, I think what we're seeing is that the domestic context for these countries is is having a huge effect on what they can bring in terms of ambition to these. Um, and so there's there may not be as much room as 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 hoped, um, but this is a, obviously a work in progress. Well, fair enough. Um, for everyone, it's a work on progress. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn to Heldiana for the next question. Uh, Heldiana, what exactly is the effect of global climate change on developing countries and their own contribution to this crisis? Uh, as we all know, developing countries are the most vulnerable uh, to climate change impact because they have a fewer resources to adapt uh, socially, technologically, and financially. Um, climate change is anticipated to have a far-reaching effect on sustainable development of the country. 
um, <clears throat> many developing countries government have given uh, adaptation actions high and urgent priorities because the developing country economy is more sensitive uh, rely on heavily uh, climate sensitive sectors uh, agriculture forest and tourism as the temperature rises further uh, regions such as Africa face decline in a crop yield, will struggle to produce sufficient food for domestic consumption, and also it will reduce the major exports and may affect their economy. Um, Africa is predicted to become more uh, variable and extreme weather events are expected to become frequent and severe with increasing risk to health and life. So uh, many of the developing countries uh, face uh, so many challenges, not only because of uh, climate change, but also there are another uh, factors which contribute to uh, the vulnerability and uh, uh, the severity of the effect of climate change. For example, the poverty, literacy level, lack of skill, weak institutional capacity, limited infrastructure, lack of technology, all these uh, factors may uh, result in severe and devastating uh, climate change impacts. So uh, developing countries are more vulnerable to climate change. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, obviously we have developing countries, we have developed countries, and we have a series of different interests depending on the scale of, of development, both economic and um, <laughs> it's a very complex issue. Um, and when we consider so many complex issues and so many different forms of bolstering an economy, Evan, what exactly do you think should get more attention at COP meetings? What should we be focusing on here to try and parse our way through this? Yes, I think it's, it's a difficult question because there's so many parts uh, in this uh, huge problem of climate change. But one topic that uh, I've focused on a lot of my research that I think should, uh, that I hope will get more attention this year and in the years to come is coming to an agreement on carbon accounting, how uh, carbon dioxide is accounted for when reducing our emissions and also if we're going to be trying to create this global carbon market through Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, uh, how do we come to agreement on how those emissions are counted to make sure that there's no greenwashing, to make sure that uh, people are, countries are accounting transparently and that we are actually getting the, uh, the correct numbers so that we can see what progress we are making and what needs to be made. Um, we have legacy emissions, meaning the amount of carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere, which is what, what is warming the earth. And we have to know, we have to understand who should be responsible for dealing with those emissions and how uh, that burden can also become an opportunity to uh, increase more technological innovation and ways that we can collaborate to reduce our emissions together. So how do we, I, I'm hoping that more conversations like that will be happening this year and in the years to come. Thank you very much. You mentioned different levels of responsibility, and it's not only um, who is who's doing it out of their own agency or sense of volition, but who is required to do something. And of course, that takes us to the realm of, uh, of international law. And so turning to uh, COP26 uh, and international law, Mary Claire, where exactly or what does international law do? What role does it have to play in shaping our response to climate change right now? Yes, yeah, Scott, that's a complex question. I think I have an entire class that I teach on it here in Cambridge. But the, um, the short answer to it is that in 1991-92, when we first negotiated the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the role of international law was to help countries to even just start sharing the science that they had and, and to start in a more transparent way sharing what some of the projections and impacts that they were learning about um, were, setting up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which now, of course, engages hundreds of thousands of the world's top scientists in every single you know, report that comes out at every single warning. 
We didn't have any of that in 92 when the framework convention was first drafted. And countries were coming to the negotiations with very, very different sets of information that had been given to them by, for example, the Atomic Energy and Coal Commission of the United States, which used to give briefings every morning on the you know, state of the world and the state of the COP um, when, when we would do our, our, our sessions. So what international law can do often is to set in place a framework which allows countries to then cooperate. The UK as presidency of the COP, you know, they, they are just taking over now. One of the um, roles that they have is to help to try to bring countries to the table and within the framework created by the international legal order to actually press countries as hard as they can to make commitments on reducing methane emissions, to make commitments on addressing deforestation. Today, we're looking at energy and there will surely be some announceables soon. So it's that possibility of knowing that you're going to be sharing some of your information, that you're going to have a nationally designated authority in each country that will actually issue reports and keep people informed about what's happening. And then that every year you're going to come together and within the framework of the Paris Agreement, look specifically at those three core commitments, you know, action on climate emission reductions and on adaptation, backed by 100 billion a year by 2020, which we are now making, I think, 79, 80 billion of that. So we haven't quite kept that commitment backed by transparency and reporting that allows us to trust the system, right? That's what the Paris Agreement created for us as international law. It changes the signals to the markets. It changes the signals to the um, universities about what we teach. It changes the signals to people who are making decisions every day about how they live their lives, how they run their businesses, how they engage as governments or as civil society. And, and that, is, that is what the framework can do for us. What it can't do is turn around and you know, send black helicopters and, and guns to stop a tiny country that has suddenly decided to um, burn part of their peatlands. And I'm not sure that um, that's what we would ever want international law to do, to be honest. There's an old saying that my old friend Wangari Mathai taught me when we were both here in the COP many years ago. She said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go together, you will be going slowly. And if you think about almost 200 countries that have signed on to this Paris Agreement and this Framework Convention, there are a lot of countries that without an annual COP wouldn't even have access to the information, let alone a chance to go together. And so the question is, what can we do outside the framework of COP and outside the framework of international law when we want to go fast but alone? And how can, when we go together, we bring everyone along with us? And that's the COP. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, when you speak of international law, uh, providing a, a loose framework within which uh, stakeholders can come together and look for solutions, um, it's that note of solutions, of positivity that I want to start asking about now. Um, and there seems to be a broad consensus that indeed the world is facing a fairly dire climate emergency that requires both mitigation and adaptation. Um, so Heldiana, turning to you uh, on this, this element of solutions and where to go next, what specifically can states do to make a significant impact in combating and mitigating the existential challenges and threats that we're facing? Well, states uh, has to uh, have a, an ambitious plan to meet the target. Uh, to reduce emission um, through um, NDC. Uh, they have to plan for uh, reducing their emission and uh, pulling carbon uh, and the burning of fossil fuels. And also they have to invest in a green economy um, and the developing states have a particular responsibility as they represent 80% of the global emission uh, at the same time, uh, developing uh, countries and emerging economies also have to work uh, to contribute an effective reduction of emission. Uh, for example, in my uh, case, in Ethiopian case, uh, Ethiopian government uh, took a commitment to reduce uh, global emission and also uh, their, the government were working um, in uh, planting seedlings 20 billion uh, planting seedlings for since 2018 uh, through uh, green legacy initiatives. And also uh, our government is investing in 
another hydro uh, uh, hydro power uh, wind energy uh, not only for the country consumption but also in the horn africa it's exporting energy to djibouti and the other neighboring countries so developing countries also uh, have to work in order to uh, mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emission and also they have to have adaptive measures in order to um, uh, sustain life and uh, mitigate the impact of uh, global warming as well as climate change yeah Oh, thank you. It's exciting when you speak of these new technologies of hydro and wind and the different modes of collaboration that they're allowing states to engage in uh, in terms of exporting energy. Uh, it's an interesting future that I think we're looking at. Uh, but, but for the next question, I want to look at uh, carbon dioxide. And I'm going to turn to Evan on this one. Evan, how exactly does carbon dioxide removal play a role in uh, us fighting climate change going forth? Yes, so for those that are uh are not familiar with carbon dioxide removal. It is the process of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, and this can be done through natural processes like planting trees, but it can also be done through more uh, newer technological processes like direct air capture. Um, and so the, the carbon dioxide removal is the process of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then storing it underground uh, in oceans, in trees, in the soil. Um, or in products and so that it can be stored for, for hundreds of years, uh, if not more than that, if possible. And um, the Interge Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has uh, made several studies showing that carbon dioxide removal is necessary to stay within 1.5 or 2 degrees uh, Celsius of warming. And um, this is not an option anymore. We have put way too much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and which has ca caused the climate change problem. And with the high concentration of CO2 that's in the atmosphere now, uh, it has to be removed in order to reduce this warming. And if we had uh, done a better job of reducing our emissions in the past, then we may not have needed carbon dioxide removal now, but because of where we are in the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, it is now something that's uh, uh, inevitable and is very necessary in order to solve the climate crisis. And- I, um, Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Didn't mean to uh, jump just, in there. I uh, just wanted to add one more thing that uh, even if we stop burning fossil fuels today, we still have the great amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that has to be removed. Uh, so it is a, a uh, problem not just reducing our emissions, but also removing past emissions uh, from the atmosphere. Well, thank you. And you speak of uh, things that we know today we wish we would have been paying more attention to 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, of course, hindsight's always 2020, but it's a testament to how complex uh, and difficult I think uh, all of these large scale transformations are from technology to energy to social behavior. Uh, so on this theme of, of complexity, uh, Jonathan, I know your research deals with complexity. What role does it play in this climate transition that we're looking at? Um, does significant climate action actually require a change in how we understand international uh, politics? Do we need to start thinking of complexity as part of politics? Yeah, um, my, uh, my own research sort of is, is trying to push towards um, not just sort of a technical or um, economic shift within climate, but also there needs to be a change in, in the ways that we think about um, what we're doing and, and how we're going about it. So uh, Paul Edwards has this idea of knowledge infrastructure, um, and that was based around earth system sciences, sciences coming together, people from around the world to try and craft this new body of knowledge that could guide, um, guide policy, that could guide uh, people trying to learn more about what we're actually doing to the planet uh, in our lifetimes. Um, so, so this is what Simon Dalby and Audrey Mitchell call uh, sort of planet politics, uh, which would sort of try and not necessarily go beyond, but try to resituate uh, how we think about national or international politics as sort of being between nation states, sort of anarchic, uh, kind of what you were talking about, um, and, and adding the idea that we are sort of planetary tipping points um, and uh, that there may not actually be the sort of uh, space for expansion that used to be there or as, or as promised uh, sort of in the past. 
Um, and so, so complexity kind of speaks to this idea that when like whatever one nation is doing or thinking they're doing um, over one place is necessarily going to influence how others react. Um, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, juggling how we change um, some of these environmental patterns and, and balancing it with things like the pandemic, um, uh, juggling it with, with things like, you know, rising inequalities, um, and also the, 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 the legitimate claims of, of sort of the, um, the least developed countries trying to uh, also help their own populations. So, um, so one concept that I'm trying to work through is this idea of future generations. Uh, and, and in Japan, they have this program for what's called future design, where they actually have uh, community members um, basically enact um, a budget making process, but as people in living in 2060. So if you can imagine that, um, you know, uh, like what would people in 2060 want us to do now is essentially the, the question and then, and then try to bring in some of those concerns. Um, so just some of those uh, switches in the way that we think could, could I think really um, get some of these thorny questions uh, within a different headspace. Oh, thank you. I know when we're talking about planet politics, that's the, the more kind of uh, the zeitgeist, the way we think about our relationship to nature and the climate, uh, and that's one way, of, of course, dealing with the climate crisis that's integral. And another, of course, is just the brass tacks of, of finance, of economy, of, of how we're going to pay these bills. And so I want to go back to Marie Claire on this one, who again is coming to us live uh, from COP26. Uh, Mary Claire, when it turns to finance, uh, what do you make of the recent pledges by the UK, by Canada, and by Europe? Um, what other pledges are key and why, why are we now calling this the finance cop? It's partly uh, just to recognize that the one time that the UK has ever received a standing ovation in the climate change negotiations has been when together with other countries we presented a final um, climate finance roadmap in the pre-COP to the Marrakesh COP right after Paris. And for some countries, this was literally the make or break it issue on whether or not they could do anything on climate change. Would they have the financial resources that were needed? Now, after seeing many governments change the direction of their entire financial system during the global pandemic, providing furloughs, providing trillions of pounds of aid, you can understand why people would be a little bit more skeptical about how, if it's important, you can't actually put the finance behind some of your commitments and that has been a very clear message here at the COP. So we've seen the UK pledging quite deeply to commit to cut emissions by 78% by 2035 compared to their 1990 levels and to reach net zero by 2050. You've seen the EU making a permit commitment to be climate neutral by 2050 and uh, cut at least 55%. Um, percent. You've seen Canada as well stepping up with a commitment to net zero by 2050 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from 30 to 40 or 45% below 2005 levels. And we've got legislation backing all of these pledges. But what we weren't sure we could put together and what can't just come from the public sector, it has to come from decisions to align private investment and private lending with the Paris Agreement to actually start the transition to a net zero world. And that finance has to come from everyone. We need to be looking at what the um, international financial institutions like the World Bank or the EDRD are giving. And we need to look at our own pension funds and we need to look at what banks do. Now I have a doctoral student who is currently researching how African banks make decisions about what actual investments they should be making. And we received an essay as part of our global essay competition from another student who looked in particular at how banks determine whether something is high risk or not and how much of a premium you have to pay, what they call a haircut, on, on an investment depending on whether or not it's high risk or whether it's stable. Did you know that fossil fuels were considered one of the most stable? They paid the lowest premiums in order to be able to get access to loans. That's not necessarily the signal we agreed to in Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement, where we said we would redirect finance. So what we're seeing is BlackRock and all of the investors and all of the private finance folk mobilized by Mark Carney and others trying to come forward and say, well, we will align with our Paris Agreement commitments, 130 trillion pounds worth. 
And at the same time, we're also seeing pledges by many countries toward others that they will actually deliver on that 100 billion a year by 2020 that was already promised in Copenhagen and that was enshrined in the Paris Agreement consensus. And so this is what I think is quite important for, for people to realize is that you know not only do we have these incredible pledges and these nationally determined contributions to the global response to climate change, these sort of NDCs, but we also have these millions and trillions that are meant to be flowing. And the question mark that, again, at least the people that I'm collaborating with from the legal advisors from all the delegations and my colleagues from the general counsel's offices and others and the judges is how can we ensure that we strengthen the system enough that we can actually rely on those pledges being met and that we can be sure that the commercial law is in place to change what is a risky investment and what is not a risky investment in the views of a bank. And, and that is, I think, something that um, many, many very bright legal minds are working on, but it's not something that I'm sure we're in yet about to crack. We're going to need, we're going to need more work. Well, thank you. Now, it's uh, immensely difficult to think about how we turn off the taps on uh, the global political economy of fossil fuels while not impinging severely on the social systems that have depended on them uh, for uh, <laughs> decades and decades up to this point. So it's complex, like Jonathan mentioned. Um, but we we're speaking now of global issues intersecting things like national banks and uh, pocketbooks of every single you know, person in the world, really, uh, how we get our daily bread. So I want to start shifting this from the global down to the national. Uh, and so, Mary Claire, I want to stick with you on this one. Uh, and there was something that popped up. I wanted to ask you about, uh, the question escaped me here. Sorry. Uh, ah, here we go. Uh, so you are the, the Leverhulme professor. Uh, you're executive secretary of COP26 Climate Law and Governance uh, Initiative. So going from the global to the local, what exactly can we learn from the worldwide national and local legal innovations and also things like climate litigation? Well, the first thing obviously that we can see is that governments have not been shy now that the international law has provided at least a bit of a framework for them to work within to start taking on commitments in the area of climate change. And we've seen climate acts, we've seen um, you know, the UK with its climate change act where the target is actually being set by a group of scientists. We've seen the United Kingdom with the Canadian, um, sorry, we've seen the Canadian team with their net zero emissions accountability act that was introduced in parliament on November 19th, 2020. We've seen lots of countries putting together legislation on climate change that touches on one or the other aspect of, of the problem, deforestation, um, a, a disaster risk reduction, um, and early warning systems, agriculture, irrigation, drought, wildfires, um, the, the, the list is endless. But what we have been able to do is to track thousands and thousands of pieces of legislation that are being adopted at the national, subnational, and even municipal, local, town council level. The decision about where you get your buses and whether they are still going to be diesel ones that affect children's health as much as they affect the climate is a decision that is taken in the end by the procurement process of your own local council. And a lot of the time, we aren't yet aligning those decisions and aligning the laws with the Paris Agreement commitments. So that is something that we're seeing shift. We're seeing governments feeling much more confident about legislating in this area. And where they don't legislate fast enough, as we've seen with the agenda case in the Netherlands and many others, we're seeing courts willing to step in and to say, this is about the human rights of citizens. This is about the right to life. And we're willing to legislate for you, or at least to enter in Canadian context into a dialogue with you in terms of what you're actually doing to protect your own citizens. So many countries, of course, that's crucial. And I think what we can say has had some impact over time, whether it's the Rocky Hill mine in Australia, or whether it's a Pakistan um, decision to push the government, or whether it's the Netherlands and a court case against Shell, there are requirements to act on climate change that people are starting to recognize in the laws of their countries, whether they're human rights requirements, whether they're environmental requirements, whether indeed they are economic imperatives to disclose the risks of your investment. Those changes in the law affect everyone and actually help to change the playing field itself. 
And I do think that that is part of the solution. Oh, thank you. I mean, uh, when you speak of the, the global ideas and legal norms affecting local solutions, it's always tough when you look at how different laws are between individual municipalities to national legal systems to international uh, organizations. So I want to actually turn to Evan on this one. Um, and of course, the United States is, is a big player uh, when it comes to uh, global climate everything. So Evan, how exactly uh, or how important is local policy in advancing climate change mitigation in, in the United States? And can it actually be leveraged for a more ambitious climate policy in the US? I think uh, local policy is extremely important especially when it can be very difficult to come to agreement at, at the global level. Um, there are so many different moving parts and things that we have to come to agreement on. So um, like Marie Claire was saying earlier about uh, how we move together, it's more slowly, but if there are areas where we can move more quickly, I think that is definitely at the local level. And some experience that I've had um, as a, a science policy fellow in New Jersey, uh, a year ago, um, I got to see a lot of the climate policy and environmental policies being made in New Jersey and um, just learning about a new state that I uh, had not uh, lived in before. Um, a lot of people uh, know about New Jersey, it's that it's known for its beaches and the Jersey Shore. And so how can we leverage more of what states are known for and uh, what people come to different states to for uh, um, visiting for tourist attractions, how can we leverage those things to help the climate? For instance, uh, because of Hurricane Sandy, a lot of the shores were um, destroyed and they have to be replenished. But instead of pumping sand from the sea floor to help that replenishment, which continues to go back to the sea floor and has to continue to be replenished, uh, instead, we could incorporate more research into using uh, olivine, which is a mineral that can absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. So how can we uh, leverage different things like that in, in a more local way to uh, increase climate action? Same things with like Arizona. I, uh, I did grad school in Arizona. Uh, we get so much sun. Arizona should be number one in solar. Uh, how, how do we really leverage those types of things? Well, thank you. It's interesting to hear the how different places within one country can of course be from New Jersey to Arizona uh, and how different the solutions have to be depending on those geographies and environments and cultures and peoples to, to enact that, that single global solution. Uh, and so I want to continue in this notion of differentiated places uh, and I'll turn to, to Heldiana. What exactly is the climate change scenario in East Africa uh, and the Horn and specifically in, in Ethiopia and what exactly are the governments doing to respond to this? As you know, Horn of Africa is the most uh, volatile region of the world. Um, uh, there is huge uh, human uh, humanitarian crisis, um, drought, um, and also conflict prone area, and also um, a bit uh, fragile uh, states are there in the region. Um, but the states, because of this and the climate change impacts, the peoples in the region are suffering from uh, drought, uh, food security, and also other uh, impacts of climate change as well as instability. Uh, and also there is high uh, number of uh, migration from the region to uh, other parts of the world. But uh, specifically in Ethiopia, uh, as you know, we have uh, active conflict in the country. Um, and uh, again, struggling with the pandemic, um, the government is trying harder to cope up with the impact of climate change, uh, as I said earlier with the initiative, Green uh, Legacy Initiative, as well as uh, there are other uh, um, initiatives which are uh, undertaken by the government. Um, Ethiopia is, as I said earlier, as a developing country, like other developing countries, it's a vulnerable economy uh, because 78% of the country's level is um, depend on, uh, employment is depend on agriculture sector. Um, and 80% of the population Ethiopia, in Ethiopia live in uh, rural areas, which is small holder farmers, uh, which are directly uh, affected by 
the impact of climate change. So the government is working toward this different measures in order to, uh, you know, deal with the vulnerability and uh, mitigate the impact of uh, this all uh, comprehensive uh, things. Uh, the government designed strategy to mitigate possible impacts of climate change, uh, adaptation activities, including sectoral plans, uh, various initiatives, for example, agricultural growth program, livestock uh, master plan, livestock and the fishery sector plan, uh, SLM, sustainable land management practice, and the green initiative is one of uh, the project, which is uh, under SLM project. Uh, to commit, uh, to fulfill the commitment that has been made by NDC. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I've actually, uh, before I move on to Jonathan to follow up with what you're saying about the economic activities and climate finance, I've actually just received word that Marie Claire is being called off to a sudden meeting to save the world uh, at COP26. So until she, she does that, we have time for one quick uh, question for Marie Claire before we get back to you, Jonathan. And I really wanted to ask you, since you're at COP26, um, how exactly the implementation of the 2015 Paris Agreement can help deliver uh, on the ambitious but crucial sustainable development goals? And I will return to the, the SDGs with the rest of the panel, but I wanted to sneak this into you uh, before you have to run. I would love to hear your thoughts on this before we turn to you. No, absolutely a, a fair, um, Scott, especially since obviously my Luger Hume professorship at the University of Cambridge has been entirely focused on you know, preparing for the COP putting together the, the, the international collaboration on, on um, law and governance um, that, is, that is going to be peaking tomorrow with the Climate Law and Governance Day here at the COP. And then, of course, also the specialization course that we teach to the junior negotiators on, on the Sunday and a couple of official side events. And, and what I will say is that, you know, in my class at the University of Waterloo and also in the class that I teach the law faculty in, in Cambridge, we've been struggling on this question and we've actually been talking it through. There are two levels we had to address it though. One is that of course, um, the Paris Agreement, the commitments on energy, the commitments on water, the commitments on poverty and hunger, the commitments on biodiversity, on innovation, they permeate the sustainable development agenda and the SDGs. But that's only one side of it, you know, and, and, and not even to mention, of course, a sustainable development goal 13, climate action itself. But the other side of it is that, and this is what my, my U Waterloo um, in-dev class concluded, if you can't address climate change, all of the other sustainable development goals don't have a hope. And, and that sort of baseline of, of you know, the modelers, and I always have so much respect for my scientist colleagues who stepped forward and said, I'm sorry, sir, we're unable to model a five degree world. It's unsurvivable. We're not gonna pretend that people could live in that world. And, and so that actually is a type of courage that I think we should be congratulating. And if we step back to our own roles as, as educators, as professors, as people in universities, part of the work here with all the SDGs is to make sure that we are finally ready to start training, not just the generations to come, but, but the generations that are already here and asking for this capacity, asking for this support, just in my own field, you know, climate law, you have out of the NDCs that have been registered, our latest study shows 169 of 188 that are, that are registered with the UN that are saying that they will need major legal and institutional reform in order to deliver on their commitments. Where are those lawyers gonna come from? There are about eight climate lawyers in all of Canada and five of them are my former students. So the capacity gap that is yawning under our feet is massive. And I do think that the Balsili School, that all of the educational institutions that we're working with have a really, really crucial role to play here. Not just on SDG 13 climate change, but on all the SDGs. You know, I, either we're training people to do this or we're training people to be Uber drivers. And, and, and I'm, I'm sort of quite hopeful that if we have hundreds of thousands of amazing universities around the world, we could get on board and start doing a little more with this and have some of those people in place that we need to implement this, you know, earth shattering crucial agenda. So that would be my final word. And thank you again for the work that you're doing. But yes, you're right. We've had a compliance matter come up 
a, a sort of a meeting is being called of all the lawyers and I promised to be there. So I'm going to thank everybody on this panel. Well, Welcome to so the chaos much. that is COP, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, for, Mary Claire, for joining us live from COP26. We appreciate it. Okay. Good luck with your meeting. Uh, Very welcome. Thank you, thank you for your okay. contributions. Bye for now. Uh, so apologies to the rest of the panel for jumping out of order a bit there, but you, uh, it's a testament to the complexity, not just of this issue, but of dealing with uh, Zoom connections going uh, intercontinental to a massive uh, <laughs> conference. Um, so I did want to return to Jonathan because we're speaking about the complexity of integrating economies, uh, foreign policies, and just the way that people live their everyday life. Uh, Jonathan, is there a chance for, or even a case for changing uh, the paradigm of economic activity and development that we're looking at? Uh, is, or is this even something that's raised at COP26? Is it just business as usual or can we look at different ways of living? Yeah, yeah, there there has been some talk, um, sort of well-being initiatives trying to change the paradigm for for, for economies away from uh, our sole focus on production towards, um, you know, the other goods, sort of social goods. Um, and and here the uh, the World Bank actually just came out with a report in, uh, last week called The Changing Wealth of Nations uh, 2021, um, where they basically argue that um, a sort of sole focus on GDP is is actually one of the root causes of uh, of exacerbating inequality and accelerating climate change. And so there needs to be a broader wealth accounting that includes social, environmental, um, household, health factors into uh, sort of a broader social understanding that um, uh, that we can't just measure our our well being by you know how much we produce and, and also what gets included um, uh, sort of in that accounting, right? So. Um, so currently fossil fuels are considered production, you know, along with all sorts of other things which are good, but, um, uh, but yeah, there, there's definitely a case that, uh, that, that this needs to be a long-term project around like changing uh, production metrics and, and, and therefore shifting the, the how nations and countries actually understand um, sort of what they're doing economically. No, thanks. Uh, when you talk about the economic disparities, of course, we, we range into the, the conversation of climate justice, right? Um, countries make the case that, hey, if you're a developed country, but you burned X amount of coal or used X amount of oil, why can't we do the same? Because we need to develop as well, right? Why do you get that benefit? Um, just because of historical hindsight, and now we don't. Um, so I, I want to turn very quickly to climate justice. And I'm going to ask everyone, because we're starting to run out of time here, to uh, answer as succinctly as possible, uh, preferably under a minute. Um, but we are recognizing that climate change is not a fair process. It's very unfair. Uh, and parts of the globe are being affected. Typically, um, those that are being hit the hardest have actually contributed the least to the problem, right? Which exacerbates um, the unfairness and uh, is a testament to the urgency of climate justice. Um, so, Heldiana, how exactly do we ensure a just global response to climate change? Some of the ambitious mitigation and adaptation measures are uh, from those who contribute less. Um, and also the larger emitters, emitters has to commit uh, to zero emission and also they have to shift uh, the energy from uh, fossil fuel to renewable energy. Uh, the developing countries need funding, I think, need funding because this climate um, you know, mitigation and adaptation project is not an easy task to do. It's a bit expensive, it needs funding. And also uh, these uh, developing countries uh, face difficulty to um, implement different kinds of projects uh, for adaptation. And also they face um, difficulties for to make sure their economy is becoming greener uh, and also to develop uh, to the path of zero emission. So those uh, larger emitters has to uh, commit to uh, the zero emission as well as they have to support the developing nation in order to uh, commit to the zero emission and also adaptation and the mitigation. That's uh, how I say, uh, and also developing countries also has to do in household level um, and also uh, policy level. For, for energy as well as uh, for consumption. Oh, thank you. I'm hearing that uh, it, it can't just be one country alone. It needs to be everyone chipping in along, uh, along the same plan. 
And so I want to turn to Evan on this question. How do we make sure that this climate change mitigation uh, actually ensures equity and energy equity in this process? Yes, uh, climate change mitigation and energy equity overlap heavily um, and in some ways seem to be going two different directions. We want to you know, reduce our emissions by uh, reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, but there are still countries uh, throughout the world that do not have access to reliable energy sources, that don't have access to electricity, and they do rely heavily on fossil fuels. So how do we make sure that we can reduce climate change while also allowing those countries to develop in the same way that uh, more industrialized countries developed as well by using fossil fuels? So it's a very difficult uh, challenge, but we do need to provide the funding, like Heldiana said, as well as technical assistance to help these countries uh, to be a part of uh, the new clean energy economy and hopefully be able to uh, achieve uh, energy equity through renewable resources. But if that is not possible, allowing them to develop uh, in, in uh, the ways that they can now until they can uh, be able to incorporate uh, renewable and cleaner energy sources. Well, thank you. When we talk about everyone uh, adopting these technologies and ways of, of integrating uh, climate action into their economy and, and their daily political processes. Jonathan, when it comes to knowledge, what exactly is the role of certain systems of knowledge uh, and foresight work in this future of climate action? Uh, and what might Canada's contribution look like? Yeah, thank you. Um, um, I just want to echo my my panelists in saying that uh, that tech transfer of financing is is absolutely crucial to this um, this this transition and um, and when it comes to sort of knowledge systems that uh, there has to be a, also a proportional investment in uh, in things like education um, uh, in, in things that, such as cultural learning about about uh, about about how other places are are trying to adapt to um, to, to climate change. Um, and I, I think Canada is, is sort of situated uh, uniquely for, um, for this kind of thing because, uh, you know, partly because uh, being a, a sort of colder nation, there, 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 are, um, there are challenges that, that, um, that we're gonna face that, that are sort of unique uh, compared to uh, less developed and, and um, island nations. Um, and in terms of futures, there's uh, cultivating s s some of this um, this work, especially around trying to think about how uh, legal orders and constitutions um, uphold certain things such, uh, such as GDP metrics um, uh, really needs to be at the center of, of uh, I guess, what we call a, a planet politics. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave that there. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, planet politics from uh, the local to the global is indeed, I think, what's needed to confront this crisis. Uh, well, you can hear the bells going on in the background of the Bell Silly School in Waterloo, Ontario. So it's time to wrap up. And we have one final question, which I'm going to ask all of our panelists to answer in what I call the lightning round. So just one or two sentences, nice and quick, so we can get it in here. What exactly is your advice to the policy community in terms of combating climate change? And I'm going to start with uh, Heldiana, advice to the policy community. Yeah, uh, I advise the policy community to rely on science findings and also mainstream uh, the climate change concept and the mitigation and uh, adaptation uh, concept in uh, scientific findings in any uh, economic sector policies, social policies in, uh, you know, international or uh, diplomacy uh, policy making. And I uh, I call upon all the policymakers and also executive uh, bodies of the states to act upon the NDC uh, commitment. Thank you. And then Jonathan, in 20 seconds, your advice to policymakers. Um, I think I'll just push to, to try and think about what a world after 2050 or uh, after these net zero targets might look like um, because you know, the world won't just stop at net zero. There, there's going to be an afterwards. So, so what does that look like? And, and I think that requires uh, imagination, requires foresight, and, and, um, and also novel ways of bridging time and experience. 
um, that we still have to develop, uh, including arts and uh, the cultural sectors and these kind of things. So, thank you, thank you, Evan. In twenty seconds, your advice to policymakers. Uh, my advice is to remember that climate change is a two-part problem. It's both the emissions that we're creating as well as the large amount of CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So we have to uh, incorporate policies that reduce our emissions and reduce the uh, and remove past emissions from the atmosphere. And also leveraging the unique aspects that different uh, that our different countries and different local areas have to combat climate change. Well, oh, thank you. Uh, all succinct, great answers and a great way to finish off a fantastic panel. Uh, I'm sure you and the audience will agree uh, it was a great discussion. We hope everyone watching enjoyed it today. Uh, I do hope that everyone will join us again next week on November 11th. We'll be broadcasting at 10 a.m. Uh, in Waterloo time or Eastern time for global insights on the topic of geopolitics and the future of human rights. So until then, thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Take care, stay safe and stay cool.